Congo Holdup is the biggest leak of data in the history of Africa. There are more than 3.5 million documents of financial data that comes from a bank called BGFI. Show the world what's been happening in Congo at this one particular bank in a way and, and at a level of detail that we've never seen before. The sort of over arching discovery was to show how the most powerful political family in the country and its friends had sort of tooled up this bank to transfer large amounts of state funds to themselves. And what we found out in the league had a lot of very interesting things to say about the way some of the Chinese mining companies that have come to dominate this sector in recent years have operated in the country and in particular the relationship between them and the entourage around former President Joseph Kabila. Laurent Kabila was laid to rest a week after being shot by his own bodyguard in one of the most bizarre of political assassinations. He succeeded by his son Joseph, believed by many to be under the control. Joseph Kabila was the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo for almost two decades. He came into power in 2001 as a very young man. He was only 29. He uh, succeeded his father, who had also been president, who was assassinated by a trusted bodyguard. Kabila Sr. had come to power only a couple of years earlier in 1997 by marching a rebel army right across the vastness of Congo and uh, overthrowing a uh, dictator who had been in power for more than 30 years. But soon after Laurent Kabila overthrew Mobutu, he kind of continued the kleptocratic ways of, of Mobutu. And his former patrons, Rwanda and Uganda, got angry. And uh, they started another war. And this became what's known as Africa's World War. And millions of people died. Almost all of Congo's neighbors became involved. There is no security. People are plundering. They are uh, doing what they call pillage. It was bloody, it was long, um, and it ended up dividing the country into several slices with different rebel groups controlling different parts and different uh, countries all allied to those different rebel groups. If we were able to reunify the Congo, we will be able to do anything else. Joseph Kabila actually brought that war to an end in 2003, negotiating a settlement with all the various countries that were involved. Soon he was eventually elected president in 2006, and he took over a, a country that is one of the richest countries in the world in terms of natural resources, but its population is, is one of the poorest. Joseph Kabila was looking to rebuild the country, rebuild the economy, and he needed cash. He tried to open up uh, Congo's vast and world-class reserves of copper, cobalt, gold to international investors. At the beginning, there were plenty of Western companies who showed interests in uh, investing in and developing these assets, but over time their interest um, has dwindled and they've departed, partly because of the unpredictability of Congolese politics, partly because of um, the reputation of, uh, for corruption in Congo. But this isn't to say that there are not major Western companies there. In fact, the biggest uh, producer of cobalt, it may well be the biggest producer of copper, is uh, Glencore, which is uh, headquartered in Switzerland. But however, in recent years, the trajectory has been more and more Chinese companies coming in. Congo has a very, very significant uh, mining industry. It's Africa's biggest producer of copper. It's by far the world's biggest producer of cobalt. In say the last 10 to 15 years, Chinese companies making the running, piling in with investments. So they've gone from a pretty bit part player to the largest producers of both metals in Congo. Nous privilégierons la mise à contribution de nos ressources naturelles pour mobiliser les financements nécessaires à l'industrialisation. The deal that really turbocharged the involvement of Chinese mining companies in the Congolese mining sector happened in 2008. And according to this deal, 
Chinese companies would build $3 billion of infrastructure and also invest an additional $3.2 billion in a huge copper cobalt mining project called uh, Sikubin. And it would be profits generated by sales of copper and cobalt from Sikumin that would pay back both investments in the infrastructure and in the mine itself. Sikumin is the mining component of what was known at one point as the deal of the century, basically trading Congo's minerals, copper and cobalt, for $3 billion worth of infrastructure projects because Congo was in desperate need after years of war for roads, for bridges, for schools and hospitals. The Chinese started to provide that. The Sikumin mine, or more accurately, mines, are located just outside Kolwezi, which is a major mining hub in southeastern Congo. And I've visited the mine several times. It is world-class, massive. You see trucks that are the size of, of a house, and sometimes hundreds of trucks just in a row, a procession coming up and down the switchbacks of the mine to get the ore out of the mine. And then it goes to a massive processing plant, again, world-class, that produces copper cathodes and cobalt, uh, which then gets shipped to, to China to be turned into pipes and wiring and car batteries and all the things that are so important for the Green Revolution. There has always been a quite considerable lack of transparency around the Sickle Means project and also the infrastructure projects that Sickle Means is paying for. Because Sickle Means profits are more or less tax-free until the debts are all paid off, there is a lot of uh, irritation and concern uh, within the Congo that this huge mining project is not really producing any benefit for Congo in terms of tax revenue and royalty revenue. C'est l'un des plus gros scandales financiers de la République démocratique du Congo, le Congo Hold Up. Ce sont des révélations d'un consortium de journalistes obtenues grâce à une fuite massive des documents issus de la banque BGFI. So the leak was obtained by a French anti-corruption organization called the Platform to Protect Whistleblowers in Africa and the French investigative news website uh, Mediapart. And then it was shared with Bloomberg and with a number of other media outlets and NGOs uh, throughout the world to comb through these documents over many, many months. We can't disclose this, the source of these documents because it's just not safe. In the leak, there were all kinds of threads that we could pull. One was that the bank at the heart of this project, which uh, is a, called uh, BGFI, it's a Gabonese bank, but it's a pan-African bank uh, that has branches all over Africa, but also in France as well. Uh, it often partners with local elites in the countries where it operates, and in the case of Congo, and a sister of the president who took a minority stake in the bank. The amazing thing is that the sister of the president actually never paid for her 40% stake in the bank. And one of Kabila's brothers, Francis Selamani, became the bank's chief executive. So right from the beginning of the existence of BGFI Bank's unit in Congo, it isn't really a stretch to call it a Kabila family company. Basically, over a six-year period, this bank had acted as a conduit to funnel at least $138 million in public funds to companies controlled by the family of the then president, Joseph Kabila, or uh, associates of him. That money came from the Congolese Central Bank, it came from Congo's state-owned mining company, and it even came from the agency responsible for uh, the upkeep of Congo's dire road network. The other thing it allowed us to do for the first time was show how major Chinese corporations were giving money to companies that eventually transferred that money to businesses that were linked to the Kabila family and associates. One of the key figures of interest in our research was a Chinese businessman named Du Wei and his company, Congo Construction Company, which held two accounts in BGFI Bank's Congolese unit. What's amazing about Congo Construction Company is that we don't think it's constructed anything. 
we found nothing that they've built over almost a decade of existence in Congo. And yet, we found tens of millions of dollars flowing through their bank accounts from major established Chinese companies through the BGFI bank to businesses linked to the Kabila family. And Duwe was born in 1979, but he was in Congo in his early 20s, already doing deals and, and doing projects. And he actually worked for Sikomin, the mine at the heart of the China-Congo contract. And then, amazingly, he switched sides. He switched to the Congolese side and started working with the office that managed the China-Congo contract. And soon after that, he created a company with a Congolese lawyer, Congo Construction Company. He was also a PhD student at the University of Wuhan. He published a paper which was complaining about the tendency of Chinese companies to engage in what he called unscrupulous means, such as bribery and corruption, to win uh, major infrastructure projects in uh, the developing world. So, probably the most sort of brazen and illuminating way in which uh, Douwei and Congo Construction Company's role as an intermediary was demonstrated was in 2016 when uh, Sikomin transferred $25 million to Congo Construction Company. Douwei subsequently distributed most of this money among people associated with Joseph Kabila. $7.5 million went to a company controlled by Kabila's sister and Kabila's sister-in-law. $1.6 million was wired to a company in the Faroe Islands that operated a vessel which was used to transport uh, animals such as uh, wildebeest, zebras, giraffes to Joseph Kabila's uh, private nature reserve just outside Kinshasa and another million dollars was sent to the director of this company. Some of these very large transactions are questionable simply because they don't seem to have a legitimate commercial justification behind them. And Joseph Kabila is the very, very guy who gave Sikumins the right to develop these very, very lucrative copper and cobalt permits the money that was supposed to fund infrastructure for Congolese citizens, you know, you know, took away and they gone, you know, money gone to President Kabila. So it was so surprised because, you, you see, the agreement is like, okay, we are going to fund infrastructure. And definitely understand why we didn't see infrastructure in the Congo. You see, so I think this is really, this is really crazy. Thank you for the opportunity and the honor of having shared your experience and your wisdom with me over the last 17 years. Basically since 2018, the year before Kabila stepped down, which was also the year where BGFI Bank forced out his brother and his sister from the bank amid accumulating scandals caused by a smaller leak of information the year before, Ever since then, uh, BGFI Bank has been trying to draw a line under its association with uh, the Kabila family. BGFI Bank declines to respond to any of our questions before we began publishing the results of our investigation. They eventually did put out a statement on their website. BGFI said that there had been management issues at the Congo branch of BGFI and that they'd addressed them years ago. It did, however, also question why these documents were leaked and suggested that maybe those documents, some were forged or inauthentic, and they suggested that they would pursue uh, anyone who leaked these documents. Joseph Kabila never responded to multiple requests from the Congo Holdup Consortium or Bloomberg News about the allegations that were made through our investigations. Some of his associates did come out and sully the investigation, suggest that they were inauthentic, suggested that there was some kind of uh, smear campaign attacking the former president. But we, as Congolese, as the convinced Duwe never responded to any of Congo Holdup's questions 
or questions from Bloomberg. And in fact, he seems to have deleted his WhatsApp account after we bombarded him with questions about his business dealings in Congo. He's no longer in Congo. Sikomin denied all allegations. They said that they were fictitious and made up and that they'd always worked within the bounds of Congolese law and international law when it comes to good business practices. I think one of the most interesting takeaways is, is the scale. We're talking about one bank, a relatively modest Congolese bank, over a six or seven year period. And this is only the money that we can be absolutely sure about, that we can trace to the satisfaction of our reporting standards. It's really a lot of money, especially when you consider that this is happening in one of the poorest countries on the planet. One of the things that Congo Hold Up tried to highlight is that, you know, there are different actors. They put, you know, in place you know, a complex and complicated, you know, system with purpose to steal money. Without, you know, Congo Hold Up investigation, I don't think so that it was even, you know, possible for us to definitively understand, you know, who played which role. It's not a surprise that there is corruption in Congo. The Congolese know this better than anyone. They experience it on a daily basis. The difference with the Congo Holdup Consortium is that we were able to bring the receipts. That has been a boon for Congolese civil society. And so there are a lot of groups, Congolese groups, that are now fighting to hold them accountable. And so that's an exciting development.